As many of you know, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a great believer in accounting numbers. But there's one number that we tend to use in corporate finance and valuation that comes from accounting. It's our accounting returns. What are accounting returns, you ask? Glad you ask. And again, I'm going to go back to financial balance sheet to illustrate the two broad measures of accounting returns you might run into. Now, there are two ways to fund a business, debt and equity. The first measure of accounting returns, look at what equity investors are getting out of the business in accounting terms. What do you mean in accounting terms? You look at the earnings they make in accounting terms, which is net income, and you divide by what they've invested in accounting terms, which is the book value of equity. Return equity is net income divided by book value of equity. There's a second measure of return that's broader, that looks across the business. It's called the return on invested capital. There you take operating income, which is income before interest expenses, because you're looking at both debt and equity. You adjust for the taxes you'd have paid on that operating income, and you divide by the invested capital. You're saying, what's invested capital? It starts with book equity, but to that you add book debt, and then you subtract out cash. You're saying, why am I subtracting out cash? Because the operating income is on the operating asset of the company, and cash is not an operating asset. So the, the denominator, book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash is invested capital and you're getting a return invested capital. Now, if you're wondering why we focus in on return invested capital and it's become a much used number in corporate finance, it's a broader measure of what a company actually makes. It can't be changed dramatically by using leverage. You actually have to take great projects. So let's take a, a closer look at the return invested capital. The numerator is usually income before interest and taxes, uh, earnings before interest and taxes. But because you, you want to return after tax terms, you multiply by one minus the tax rate. You're saying, which tax rate should I use? Well, you can use the effective tax rate because that's basically what you paid on average, but you're applying it on the entire operating income. Even though you paid only on your taxable income, you're acting like you paid it on your entire operating income. Let me give you an example. You have $100 million in operating income, $40 million in interest expenses. Normally, your taxable income is $60 million, right? $100 minus $40. Let's say you paid $15 million in tax. It's a 25% tax rate. That's $15 million on $60 million. I'm going to take the 25% tax rate and apply it on the entire $100 million because this is often called a return that you'd have made with, I mean, basically, you're trying to compute a return as if you had no debt, operating income, net of taxes. In the denominator, you take the book value of equity right out of the balance sheet, plus the book value of debt, interest-bearing debt, as well as leases, whatever you counted as debt in your cost of capital, minus cash and marketable securities. That's the invested capital. So return in invested capital is a composite measure on what a company is making on its existing projects. If you're wondering, why should I care? First, it can be used as an assessment, a simplistic assessment of how well or badly a management is doing. A, comp a management that is doing its job well should be able to deliver higher returns on invested capital, on the capital that they've invested. And you can see if that return on capital is higher than your cost of capital. So that becomes one simple comparison. The other is you can compare the return on capital for your company to an industry average. The reason I give you the industry average is you can compute your company's return on capital compared to the industry average to see how it measures up against a peer group. So that's the first use assessing how well a company is taking existing investments. The second is, and this becomes more dicey, you can use that past return on capital as a forecast for the future. The, the logic is fairly simple. You're saying, no, if I've made 15% returns in the last 20 years, why shouldn't I make 15% in the next step? Well, why shouldn't you? Well, things might have changed, but to the extent that things have it, it becomes the basis for forecasting the future. And finally, looking at trend lines and returns in capital can give you an indicator that a business is changing, for better or worse. So if your return in capital 20 years ago was 30%, it dropped to 20% 10 years ago, and now it's down to 15%, the trend's working against you. For whatever reason, this business is getting less attractive, so it's a, it's a good measure of comparisons across time. So as you look at the return invested capital in this data set, I want to alert you to some of the choices I made to compute the return on capital that you will see. The first is my operating income is earnings before interest and taxes with leases treated as debt. When you treat leases as debt, lease expense doesn't show up as an operating expense. Incidentally, IFRS and GAAP have moved closer to this point of view that I've always had. 
So what you're seeing is earnings before interest and taxes reflects the perspective that you know you you're treating lease expense as an op as as a financial expense, not an operating expense. So that's your that's your and I use the most the most recent twelve months, the last twelve months of data, because in January first of any year, I don't have the whole year's data. I have it through the first three months, and the the last quarter, first three quarters, and the last quarter of the previous year. So trailing twelve months. For the tax rate, I use the effective tax rates over the most recent 12 months. So that tax rate can be 0%, 10%, 20%, 30%, whatever the actual, whatever the effective tax rate is. Now, so I also capitalize R&D because in my view, R&D is really not an operating expense, the capital expense. I use a five-year life for all companies. Why for all companies? Because I have 47,000 companies. I can't finesse this too much. I capitalize R&D, and for those of you unfamiliar with the process that I use to capitalize R&D, check out the R&D, uh, the data set that's on my website as well, that will give you more clarification on what exactly I'm doing. I do net out cash and goodwill from book value equity and book value debt. So I start take the book value equity at the start of the most recent fiscal year, the total book value of debt, including lease debt at the start of the most recent fiscal year. I net out cash and I net out goodwill. The goodwill part is a little controversial. The argument for netting out goodwill is what you paid for growth assets and acquisitions, and you cannot be expected to earn operating income on it. But to the extent that goodwill also includes overpayment and acquisitions, there's an argument that some of it should be left in. Again, I can't finesse this across 47,000 companies, so I take goodwill out. So my earnings before interest and tax in the last 12 months, effective tax rate, book value of equity and debt at the start of the most recent fiscal year, I net out cash and goodwill. That adjusted invested capital is what you see in the denominator. Incident, incidentally, the capitalization of R&D will add to my book value and the capitalization of leases will add to my book value of, of debt. The R&D adds to my book value of equity. Now, I've always I've computed and used ROIC for most of the three decades, but I've done it with open eyes and I've actually you know, written extensively about the, uh, about the limitations of trusting a return on capital. Talked about the accounting issues that come from leases and R&D being miscategorized. The leases now seem to be okay, you know, categorized correctly, at least with IFRS and GAAP, but R&D still continues to be a problem. If you have abnormal earnings, low or high, that can affect the last 12 months. So one way around that is to look at an average across time. There's a life cycle effect. Young companies will often report low returns in capital, not because their projects are bad, but because you're catching them early in the life cycle. So that's in the numerator. In the denominator, the same R&D lease effect would show up as a book value that is not right, an invested capital that's too low. Accounting write-offs can make your invested capital look too low. In effect, you're writing off your mistakes, making your return on capital higher than it should be. And finally, in much of the world, accounting numbers are not adjusted for inflation. So if you have inflation, your return on capital can be inflated by that inflation. And that's, you know, that's something to keep in mind when you look at accounting returns on capital. I hope you find this data set useful, at least in looking at returns on capital across industries for the most recent time period. Thank you very much for listening.